This is a 30-minute preview of the full two-hour course available for purchase at masterhdrvideo.com. The full course will finish the discussion on the Creative Image Pipeline, explore how PQ and HLG HDR work, walk you through what you need to get started in HDR, discuss the basics of creative shooting for HDR, and demonstrate the basics for color correcting in HDR. Everything you need as a foundation to understanding how the medium works and to get you started working in it creatively today. This video is mastered in HDR, and for the best learning experience, you should watch it in HDR on a television or device with HDR support. HDR video is both a buzzword and a promise of a better future. It's a new kind of technology embraced by broadcasters, all major Hollywood studios, and digital-first streaming services like Amazon and Netflix. It's been embraced by television and device manufacturers around the world, to the point that it's becoming harder and harder to find a screen that doesn't have some kind of HDR compatibility. It has native operating support on Windows, Mac OS, Android, and iOS and native color support on nearly every professional video creation or manipulation application. Unlike some of the smaller or incremental changes in video tech, consumers have adopted HDR in droves right as the technology hit the market and have preferentially sought out HDR content over traditional SDR content when it's available. It's a difference consumers can see and it has changed the standard for the best images that we, as professional filmmakers and creatives, can make. The best image you can deliver is no longer to the cinema screen. Home televisions and many other devices have better resolution and far greater dynamic range than the cinema. Because of that, many brands, agencies, and clients are interested in HDR and what it can do but don't know how to get started in producing or delivering HDR content. For us independent filmmakers and freelancers, it's also a terrifying and somewhat scary development that's thrown our workflows and creative strategies out of whack. There's a lot of basic information out there and some very intense technical information, but very little of it is geared towards helping us, the creatives, understand what HDR is, how we can use it creatively, and where to look for more information. And that is why I've written and produced this course on HDR video. Let me introduce myself. Hi, I'm Samuel Billado. I'm an independent filmmaker, colorist, and expert in video technologies, including high dynamic range video. Thanks for joining me in my home office and welcome to my inaugural course from scene to screen, the HDR image pipeline. The goal of this course is to help you get an overview understanding of what HDR is, and to start to help you see how you can use what High Dynamic Range has to offer as a creative cinematic medium. I hope that you'll get three big takeaways from this course. First, HDR is understandable. Second, working in HDR isn't as hard or expensive as you may think it is. And third, HDR is a medium that will let you improve your images and expand your creative visions. When I teach any subject in person, I try to adapt how I teach to the background and understanding of each individual I'm working with. Now, because of the magic of video, I can't see you and I don't know your background. But regardless of that, I'm gonna do my best to help you understand both the technical and creative aspects of HDR, regardless of your current level of understanding and background knowledge. And regardless of whether you're an all-in-one independent content creator, a professional director or cinematographer, colorist or effects artist looking to improve your creativity in the media, a DIT filling a hybrid technical creative role in the industry, or work in a creative support role like a post-supervisor, producer, 
or any other below the line or industry adjacent role that ultimately supports the creative work in HDR. We're going to take it slow in this course and build a broad knowledge framework for you to plug in more detailed information later or for you to use as a foundation for your creative explorations. The other courses and videos here on masterhdrvideo.com are gonna go deeper on the specifics of the creative and technical work of HDR, like how to plan your shoots in HDR to take advantage of human perception and the latitude the medium has to offer, how to bring your grades and looks in HDR up to the next level beyond what you could do in SDR, how to technically create graphics and visual effects in HDR, how to manage colors across different displays and between different camera platforms, and all other foundational concepts that you need to truly master the medium within your role. Here's what we're gonna to cover together in this course. First, I need to make sure that we're all on the same page and understand the core technical language we're going to be using throughout this course and throughout our whole journey to understand HDR together. So I'm gonna start by defining dynamic range. What is it? and how do we measure it? Next, I'm gonna walk you through two block diagrams, the scene-to-screen technical diagram and the scene-to-screen creative diagram. These are conceptual illustrations of how we actually move from light in front of the camera to the light that ends up on our viewers' screens and will help us see both the technical and creative steps we have been taking with our SDR content to get images out to our viewers and how we will adapt those to HDR. After getting that bird's eye view of the video process, we're going to see what's changed with HDR at a technical level and introduce you to the two major flavors of HDR, perceptual quantization and hybrid log gamma, along with the variety of strategies for getting the best HDR images to all screens, including Dolby Vision, HDR10+, and SLHDR. And as part of that discussion, we're gonna cover what you need from a technology point of view to get started working in HDR today. While I know that going through the technical details can be a little intimidating for us creatives, it's important to have at least a basic understanding of what HDR is and is doing if you and I want to create the best possible HDR content. Just like a painter or other artist needs to understand how paint and canvas interact to create their best work, and how in the past we needed to understand celluloid film and how it interacted with light in order to truly master photography, truly mastering the art of cinematography and color correction today requires us to understand how the tools we use do what they do, at least at the most basic level. After covering the technical basics, I want to walk you through the creative basics for HDR. We're going to look first at the basic changes you're going to need to make when you start planning your scenes for HDR. While this may seem a little unnecessary for you colorists and technical people to go through, I want to remind you that you're going to be executing the cinematographer's creative vision, and you benefit from understanding how they can now plan and explore HDR creatively. By understanding what the cinematographer could want, you won't accidentally limit their vision on set or in the grading and mastering suites. After that, we're going to discuss the creative process of color correction and look development. While in some ways that section is geared most towards colorists and technicians who will need to execute the look, the creative conceptual process is as applicable to you as a director or cinematographer, since you're ultimately responsible for crafting the look of your work in HDR. Knowing the process and adjustments your images will go through to come out the other side in HDR will let you elevate your creativity within the medium. And for the technical crew or people watching, the creative process of HDR mastering gives you a framework for where adding your technical expertise will let the creatives focus on the creativity. The last thing we're gonna to cover together is how to conform and deliver our HDR content and some of the ways to adapt our HDR grades to SDR so that we can continue delivering high quality images to all of our viewers, whether they have access to HDR or not. 
Because the HDR mastering process can be hard to visualize, I'm going to wrap up the whole discussion with a full demo that shows all of the creative and technical steps to mastering HDR content. So that's the plan. But before we get to all that, let's start with a little bit of history. Where did HDR come from? All digital video technologies started out as a complement to older analog technologies and were designed to be incorporated into traditional analog workflows. The signals from modern digital cameras were patterned after old analog cameras. Modern digital screens were patterned after old analog screens. And our digital cinemas were patterned after both traditional film and the digital methods used in broadcast and distribution. And all of these new digital technologies were limited in color and dynamic range by the analog standards they were designed to blend seamlessly into. This was convenient at the time, and it meant that everything was designed to work together without us creatives really having to think about what our cameras or displays were doing. Right up through the early 2010s, digital video had a fairly simple what you see is what you get approach to creation. We never had to think about how a camera screen or program did what it did. It just did what it did. But there was a big problem with technology that was slowly becoming apparent. New cameras could capture more dynamic range than traditional video could store, transmit, and display. New digital displays could reproduce more dynamic range than traditional analog screens and had higher color purity, allowing them to recreate more colors than ever before. But the signals and applications connecting our cameras to our screens limited both color and brightness dynamic range. If we wanted to make any more advances for images in the future, something had to change. And so two new video signal standards for HDR were developed and made available to us professionals to allow us to deliver higher dynamic ranges captured by the camera to our own professional displays and to our audience's consumer displays. The first standard launched was Dolby's Perceptual Quantization HDR standard first announced in 2014, and it was followed in 2016 by the BBC and NHK's Hybrid Log Gamma HDR standard. We'll cover what those standards are in a minute, and how they're different. But from a historical point of view, what we need to know is that slowly, these HDR standards were adopted by others, including television manufacturers, studios, and broadcasters. And over time, HDR has come to the programs that we, creators and artists, use to actually create our content. But because of the large variety of video formats and standards now available in our cameras, programs, platforms, and displays, we've lost the what you see is what you get everywhere approach to video. Now, when we think about our images, we have to care about how our cameras, programs, platforms, and displays are managing our images. And start thinking about our images as being separate from the video data that describe them. This kind of understanding will make the difference between muddling through the medium and mastering the nuances of light and color for now and in the future. Let's move on from history now to actually defining what we're talking about. What is high dynamic range video? Really quick so that we're all on the same page, the term video as we're using it here and in the context of HDR includes all of the technology, processes, and data that use electricity or digital values to capture light from a scene, store it as a file, alter it, transmit it, and eventually recreate it as an image made of light on a display. In the past, the word's been limited to television and its related technologies, and has had some negative connotations about quality, mostly because of the inferiority of television and VHS tapes compared to the high aesthetic quality of celluloid film in the cinema. But today, it's a lot broader of a concept, 
and includes all of the digital capture and post processes for the modern digital cinema, including the digital capture of images shot on film. So what about dynamic range? What does that mean? Let's start broad, since dynamic range isn't a concept limited to light. Dynamic range is a measurement of the difference between the highest and lowest intensities within any kind of changing signal, light, sound, electricity, radio, heat, or whatever. For light, dynamic range is all about brightness. It's the difference between the brightest and the darkest part of a scene or frame. The brightness changes across a whole piece or the brightest or darkest values allowed by the camera, display, or video signal that carry these images. Dynamic range is a kind of resolution. Just like your frame size gives you more spatial resolution, or details within a frame, and your frame rate gives you more temporal resolution, or details over time, dynamic range is all about brightness resolution. It's how big of a difference can you capture or reproduce from the brightest parts of an image or scene before you clip to white to the darkest part of the scene before you crush to black and lose all the details in the darks. There are a couple of ways of measuring light's dynamic range, depending on whether we're talking about scenes, cameras, or displays. For cameras, the most common way to talk about dynamic range is in terms of relative exposure values, plus or minus EVs, or stops of light, using the camera's exposure as a reference point. Each one-stop adjustment, or plus or minus EV, represents a doubling or halving of the amount of light energy, with a difference of one stop equaling the same difference in light as one EV. When we move away from talking about camera exposure, the official generic term for this doubling or halving of light is a step, which is the term I'm gonna use throughout the rest of this training, except when I'm talking specifically about exposure. When it comes to the absolute dynamic range a camera can capture, you may see dynamic range expressed in decibels, like what you'll see expressed as a signal to noise ratio. Here, a change of six decibels is equal to one step. On displays, you'll usually see dynamic range written as a contrast ratio, usually expressed as a linear light ratio like 1000 to 1. We can convert this ratio into steps by taking its base 2 logarithm. 1000 to 1, for instance, is 9.97 steps. On a modern display, you'll find the peak brightness of the display listed in nits, which is an important measurement to know about when dealing with HDR. A nit is one candela per meter squared. It's a unit of brightness we use for displays that links the total light output of the display to its screen size. What's important about nits is that one nit looks the same on all screens, regardless of how big they are. At the most basic level, all you need to remember about nits is that nits equals linear light output at the display. You can divide the peak brightness in nits by the display's static contrast ratio to find a display's black point, or use a display's listed black point with the peak white point to calculate the display's dynamic range. I like to visually illustrate dynamic range using a step chart. On this gradient scale, each block represents a single step. When reproduced in HDR, the chart is centered with zero at 18% gray for a camera or 12 nits for a display. We're going to use this gradient to compare the dynamic range of different kinds of images and video systems, since it's a really great visualization of their limits and how they're altering the dynamic range from a scene or mastered image. So now we know what dynamic range is and how to visualize it. So let's finish our definition of high dynamic range video. HDR video is a video system that seeks to capture, transmit, store and reproduce images with a higher dynamic range than traditional video systems allowed. 
This is different than traditional HDR photography that sought to capture high dynamic range and then tone map it into the same standard dynamic range for delivery and reproduction. The way that we capture, move, and reproduce images acts like a dynamic range box that can limit the range of brightnesses you can capture and reproduce. The whole point of HDR video is that it's a bigger box than traditional video systems. SDR TV signals have typically been restricted to somewhere between 5.4 and 8 steps of dynamic range, and digital cinema has had between 10 and 12 steps of dynamic range. HDR video systems extend the available dynamic range to between 18 and 26 or more steps of dynamic range, which is much closer to the human visual dynamic range of around 34 steps below the threshold where brightness causes pain. Typical consumer HDR displays today have around 14 steps of dynamic range, while the highest end professional master HDR displays have between 18 and 20 steps and the technology is only getting better every year. This bigger box opens up a much bigger world of creativity and realism for our artistic content. Broadcast and cinema quality cameras have been capable of capturing high dynamic ranges for years, but in order to deliver their images to our audience in SDR, we've been squishing that dynamic range into the small SDR box, crushing and clipping our highlights and limiting our looks to what TVs or the cinema could safely do, which usually meant placing our mid-tone values at the same brightness level, shot over shot, scene over scene, and crushing the overall image dynamic range. HDR video allows us to take that scene and camera dynamic range and directly move it to the audience's screen. For live broadcast, this gives us a far more natural and realistic image, allowing you to transport the viewer to the venue. For more cinematic style content, we can decide the brightness range we want to place it in on the viewer's screen. Brighter for outdoor, happier, high energy scenes. Darker for indoor, scary, foreboding content. Having this kind of dynamic range to play with allows us content creators to trigger proper psychovisual effects, psychological states triggered by visual phenomena. We're able to get our audience to feel the changes in brightness throughout a piece and better trigger the emotions that go along with these feelings of brightness. One flavor of HDR video, perceptual quantization or PQ, has also solved what is probably the biggest pain for most creatives the problem of content looking wildly different on different screens. Consumer screens are always brighter than the reference screens we use in color correction and scale our SDR master content to the contrast ratio of the screen in a way that gives non-uniform contrast shifts and shifts in color reproduction. On the other hand, PQ HDR is designed so that the brightness and contrast levels and colors you see in your grading space will get translated to the end viewer's screen with far greater fidelity than with SDR. While some users may still choose to adjust the picture on their end, for the most part, they should be seeing the image as you and I artistically intend it to be seen. Because HDR is such a bigger box than SDR, it does get rid of a concept that most of us use when thinking about our images, the concept of white or black. SDR's smaller box forced us to put our brights as close to code white as we could and our darks as close to code black as we could. But with HDR, there's no such thing as white or black. Instead, we have a range of whites above our midtone exposure that we can retain and reproduce details within. Similarly, we now have a much deeper range of darks and blacks below our midtones to explore creatively. We'll look at some of the ways to do that in a little bit here in this course, but we'll go into far more detail on what the elimination of black and white allows us to do in HDR in the course for cinematographers shooting for HDR, 
which you can find here on masterhdrvideo.com. HDR video still has some limitations, especially on the display side, though these will disappear in the next few years. It's still a box, but it is a much, much bigger box than traditional SDR video and is the largest canvas for creating our images for years to come. Now that we've defined what HDR as a concept does, let's turn to how it actually does it. This diagram illustrates the scene to screen technical image pipeline. We start with light landing on a physical or virtual scene. We capture that light with a camera or render the digital scene with a virtual camera to map the scene's light into digital data, the ones and zeros that make up our video files. We take that data and store it, alter it creatively or technically, and transmit it to a screen that takes the data and converts it back into light. I wanna pause for a minute and make one thing clear. The data that we store and alter is not our image. The image is the light we see at a display. The ones and zeros that make up our video files represent our image. And when correctly interpreted by the display, the display will recreate our image. That's an important distinction to keep in mind as we start to talk about high dynamic range video for two big reasons. The first is that as creatives, we tend to think in terms of what we want to see changed in our images, but we have to enact that change by altering our data. We want things to be brighter or darker, more or less contrasty or colorful, or want to restrict the colors we see on the screen in some way. All of these are changes to the image, and we do them by adjusting the gain or gamma or RGB balance or saturation or hue angle adjustments, which are all adjustments to the data. The second big reason to understand the distinction between data and image is because it's possible to store or move the same image using different data. And so long as we interpret the data correctly at the display, we can convert from any data format to another and end up with the same image on the screen. If we accidentally or incorrectly interpret the data at the display, we'll end up with a different image than we started with or intended. The task of preserving the color brightness and contrast characteristics of an image when converting from one kind of data to another and interpreting it at a screen is called color management. The links or maps between light and data are called transfer functions, and they tell us how to interpret brightness information captured by a camera and store it as digital values, and how to take digital values at a display and turn them back into light. You're probably already somewhat familiar with transfer functions, since camera log, ACES CC, linear, gamma 2.4, and gamma 2.6, those are all different transfer functions. Let's go back to our technical scene to screen block diagram and see how this worked in traditional SDR video. In SDR, the cameras relied on gamma-based transfer functions to map from the potentially infinite dynamic range of a scene into the limited digital values available. The digital signals retained only five to five and a half steps of the scene's original dynamic range. The data was stored, altered, and transmitted to the displays where the gamma function was mostly reversed and recreated the original image with a little bit more contrast between 5.4 and 6 steps originally, and up to 10 or 12 steps with modern high-quality screens and digital cinema projectors. 
But for many years, cameras have been able to capture higher dynamic ranges than SDR would allow us to store and transmit. The dynamic range would be useful in creating images for the digital cinema. So instead of using gamma to encode the light captured by the camera, we switched to camera raw and camera log formats that, depending on the settings of the camera, can capture anywhere from 8 to 18 stops of dynamic range. We then creatively compressed or expanded the camera's original data into 5.4 steps of dynamic range for televisions and 12 steps of dynamic range for the digital cinema. As times moved on, modern consumer and professional displays have exceeded the 5.4 step limit and have been adding huge amounts of contrast to our images, like we saw in the previous section. Professionals like you and me wanted to be able to send more of the dynamic range they were creating on set to consumer displays, just like they were doing for the digital cinema. The displays themselves were capable of higher dynamic ranges, but there was no standard way to move this higher dynamic range to the displays. In order to make HDR work, we needed new ways of storing and moving image data. This is where perceptual quantization and hybrid log gamma come in. What's unique about PQ and HLG is that while we've had higher dynamic range transfer functions for capture and editing like log and ASIS, PQ and HLG are designed to deliver that high dynamic range to the end user as a replacement for Gamma 2.4 so that the displays know that they're reproducing a high dynamic range image. The way that PQ and HLG work are a little different and it's worth talking about what their pros and cons are, especially for content creators. We're gonna cover the ins and outs of how they work in the next section. Right now, I want you to remember that PQ and HLG are data formats that allow us to deliver HDR to our end viewers. Now that we've covered what HDR adds to our scene to screen process technically, let's go back to our scene to screen technical block diagram and add in the scene to screen creative block diagram. This has been a 30 minute preview of the full course from scene to screen, the HDR image pipeline available for purchase at masterhdrvideo.com. Head over there where we'll finish the discussion on the creative image pipeline, explore how PQ and HLG HDR work, walk you through what you need to get started in HDR, discuss the basics of creative shooting for HDR, and demonstrate the basics for color correcting in HDR. Everything you need as a foundation to understanding how the medium works and to get you started working in it creatively today.